is James now gives six additional, remember there are 10 characteristics. He gives six additional characteristics of demonic wisdom in verses 14, 15, and 16. When he comes to verse 14, he says, he, and listen, we've been saying this a lot lately, trying to remind you that what is the target in man is made, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, he said man is made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Now, the truth of the matter is what he's after is to attack the soul. If he, if he can win the soul, then you've, you've got everything else under control. It's the engine. Within that soul, the key is the heart. The key. When you look at mentality, you know, you, when, you, when you lay up the soul, you've got you got self-conscious self -conscious and conscience and mentality of volition and emotion, looking at that in a general terms. When you have mentality, see, one side of it is the mind, and the other side is the heart. The heart's the key, because the heart is where the beliefs are. And that's what the devil is after, destroying your beliefs. Get your beliefs different. Now... The way he does that infiltrates your soul through false teaching. He infiltrates your soul. In order for him to do that, he gets you distracted, falling away from the faith, and paying attention to seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. You have no idea how much of that is in the Christian church today. It was in the first century. This is what these guys are fighting. They're fighting every book that you read in the New Testament. These guys are fighting it. They're fighting it. Philippians, Corinthians, Timothy, all these books. I just, I just quoted three that had these words in them. The whole book, a book of Acts, uh, whatever you, listen, the heart, the heart, the human heart, and I'm talking about thinking mechanism, the heart is the bullseye target in the angelic conflict because it's the center of belief. It's where your beliefs are. If you do a good study on the, on the concept of the heart, you'll, you'll discover that. Here's James 3.14, and, and he tells you that in James 3.14. Listen to what he says. If that's a first-class condition, and it's true, if it's true in the apotheosis, it's true in the, if it's true in the apotheosis, it's true in the apotheosis. If it's true in the if part, it's true in the then part. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, heart remember we talked about this in mark 7 20 through 23 it is the evil thoughts of the heart that defile that corrupt see devil knows that that's evil and so he says he 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 he, he gives a characteristic and we all, we got four we're looking for the last six so he says bitter jealousy if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant. That may is a negative. Do not. Do not be. Do not be boastful against the truth of the word of God. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. Isn't that something? Why would you, and, and it's somebody that knows the truth and now lies against it. It's someone who used to boast about God answers prayer and God's word is supreme and, and oh, you know, God did a miracle in my life because he said yada yada and I trusted and God did it. That's all. That boast no longer goes that way. The boast now go, goes towards the, the enemy's camp. It now goes towards the cosmic system. You understand that? Double-minded? Yeah, double-minded concept. Do not be arrogant. Do not be boastful, prideful about, oh, I had a breakthrough. 
I discovered something outside of the Word of God. I, I discovered something that's so fantastic outside, revelation outside the Canada Scripture. I need to share it with you. So much goofiness comes out of that concept. Extra biblical revelation that you can't tie to the word of God. Jeez. Don't fall away from faith to give to, a, to deceptive spirits like that. I mean, a working object of your faith has got to be from the canon of Scripture. How are you, you going to back it up? Well, it's my word, and you got to trust me with it. Mm-mm. 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 James just, James just gave four characteristics of demonic wisdom in verse 14. I underlined it for you. Then in James 3.16, he gives two final characteristics. Now, he's already mentioned jealousy and selfish ambition, right? So I don't count them again. Agreed? But he says where these characteristics of demonic wisdom exist, there is chaos. There is disorder. There is confusion and turmoil and chaos. Why? Because he's a liar. He's a bull-faced liar. Oh, all the time? It's his nature. Liar is who he is. He's the angel of darkness who disguises as the angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11. Listen, you've got to be on your toes. We live in the angelic conflict. We live in the last days. In the last days, the Spirit says there will be a falling away of the faith and the, and the truth will be so polluted. But not to the person who stays, keeps their head in the Word of God. You always check what somebody says based on what the Word of God says. Right? <clears throat> well, he gives the final two. He says, there is disorder, turmoil, confusion, and chaos. You've spent any time in the world. I mean, did you get saved out of the womb? A lot of people do. And then some of us, we, we hung our hat out there in the world until we got beat to death. And then got saved, thank God. I remember this world. I played in this world. I know that this world is a world of confusion, turmoil, and chaos. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how slick you are. This is where it is. This is the name of the game. This is the story of the prodigal son. In 1 Corinthians... This is probably not on your paper, but it ought to be. In first Corinthians, because I, I put it on mine. See if it's on yours. First Corinthians 14, 33. Did I put it there? 14, 33. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. You know what it says? It says, now this is in a great passage, 12, 13, and 14. It's talking about spiritual gifts. And the fact that false teaching was causing chaos in the church over it. False teaching was causing chaos in the church over, over spiritual gifts, false teaching. And he says to them, quit that foolishness. God is a God of order. Right? Not chaos. When you got chaos, you got the other guy in camp. That's how simple that is. I don't care if it's your marriage, your church, your family. I don't care where it is. That's what you got in there. It's not God. God ain't doing that. God, God, God wants order. 
The devil wants chaos. He tells you, well, that's the way, you, that's normal living. This everything chaotic. I mean, you got to think on your toes, man. This is, I mean, you got to be, you got to be on a, you got to be on a stick all the time, man. Somebody's out to get you. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Thank God he delivered us from that foolishness. Listen, if you got it in your home, you know what you got in your home, don't you? If you got it in your marriage, you know what you got in your marriage, don't you? You got people who talk God and don't live him, right? Because God is a God of order, and the order comes from doctrine, doctrine in your soul. Doctrine in your soul calms your spirit down. It puts order in your life. And those who don't have it, we call it counseling. It's okay because some people don't know. They're in chaos. They live in the world way of thinking, and we have to pull them out of it. And maybe we can and maybe we can't. We give it a shot. If we can't, then they've gone the other way. I mean, the prodigal son will have to find his own way back home, right? You go drag him home, he'll be twice the child of hell he was when he left. He's got to come make his journey home on his own. Now, when I say on his own, I mean I'm with God, God in him. Now he's got a partner that'll be with him forever in eternity. You do understand that. Now, the, set, the final one that he gives us, disorder, watch this, is every evil thing. Now, what's interesting here is there are different words for evil. When he refers to the devil and what his nature is, he calls it paneros. Paneros. The evil one, like in 1 John 5, 19, the evil one. I mean, he's evil because that's who he is. He's a liar because that's who he is. That's who he is. He's the we would say he's the epitome of evil. Now, in, in behavior, you got a couple different things. What he sells is kakos, K-A-K-O-S. What he sells is evil. He sells it. Now, his nature is ponderos. But what he sells, what are you selling today, buddy? Oh, <laughs> I, got the, I got the watermelons of watermelon. You can cut a slice of this watermelon, and it'll go right back. And you can eat this watermelon. You bought one watermelon that'll last you your entire lifetime. Okay? Yeah. You buy the watermelon, take it home, and it, you only get one, one and a half slices out of it, and it rolls over and dies on you. And you go, like, I've been had. been had the word that's used here is neither of those two words it's not who he is and not what he's selling it's behavior it's the behavior of evil it's p-h-a-u-l-o-s i wrote it on your paper and it's phragma phragmatic it's evil behavior it's phragmatism that's the Greek word. It's evil behavior that you, you, you have developed a system, a unit of, a unit of system. You, you figured out how it works categorically in your life. And your behavior comes off from fragmentism, that, that ability to separate and develop a little a little system for your own behavioral, and you do it with everything in your life. And so you think, you think, <laughs> you think you have order because you've put disorder in categories. <laughs> well, let me give you an example. You stuff everything in a closet. Okay, 
we're good. That's the hall closet. That works so well, you decide to do it in all the other closets in your house. Now, the truth of the matter is, it looks good until you open the door and there is chaos. Right? That's this idea. That's this idea. Then we go to the garage and we do the same thing. You get a guy in there to build a, a, a compartment in the garage so that you can stuff everything in there and you drive your car and you're not hey, see nobody sees it. It looks orderly. Right? The truth of the matter is what you have done is fragmentize you. What you have done is you've just hit it. You've put it in things that make you feel better about your chaotic life. That's not true. That's the way the devil works his system. Out of sight, out of mind, right? That <laughs> you have to open the closet. You're good to you know, all your winter stuff in there. Yeah, it's good till you open it up. You got to have winter clothes. And it's like <laughs> falls out. And you go like, oh, James. Then so you say, so, well, here's what we'll do. We'll put it in the attic. <laughs> so the stuff you don't want to hide in the closet, you hide in the attic. Or in the basement or whatever. And the devil says, don't let, any don't let any preacher tell you you've got a chaotic life. Look at your house. Don't open any doors. Don't open the cabinets. Don't open the refrigerator. Don't open it. We still stuck it in there. Don't do it with your life. Okay? Don't do it with your life. You get into it because, listen, here's what God, God wants order. Devil, devil, he, he, your life is chaotic. All he does, if it bothers you, then he just tells you how to, how to fix it and put it categorically in a, just put it in a closet over here. Okay, you know where it is, right? You know where, you, you remember what you put in there? Mm, I've got a pretty good idea. Well, you know right where it is. Don't worry about it. You know, you know right where it is. Now, don't you feel better? Oh, I feel so much better. I know. No chaos. Don't do that, people. That's the way his system works. Now, you know I'm not talking about closets, right? <laughs> okay. Don't get worried now. I'm not going to come to your house and open your closet and go like, ah, ha, ha. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not the closet inspector. But I'm just telling you how he does it with your real life. The third point I'd like to make about demonic wisdom. Demonic wisdom is Satan's alternative, is the alternative to divine wisdom in the angelic conflict. Now, for an unbeliever, when an unbeliever goes negative to the truth of God, that we call it God consciousness, demonic wisdom fills the void. See, it's always there to fill the void. Hey, hey, hey can't create anything except chaos. Now, he can create chaos. He fills a void with the alternative. For example, in Romans, the first chapter, 18 through 22. This is a great passage on this. You know what creation is? You know, you know what Paul says creation is? It's a visual aid to the world. So it's a visual aid to the world. You know, I talked about this last night with the tree of knowledge of good and evil that was a visual aid of the angelic conflict. It's a visual aid from Bible study. They could look at the tree and go like, ah, there's the angelic conflict. Good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, creation, when you read Romans here and you get into verses 20 through 23, let's just go there for a moment and take a look at this. <clears throat> See, now, let me tell you, the average guy don't know this, but the devil does. 
He understands in creation, he understands exactly what creation reflects. Now, if I never find Romans, here, I go from Acts to Corinthians. I know I'm in a neighborhood. Here we are, and I'm, I'm looking at verse 18, uh, just to glance at it. Uh, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk my way down. Verse 19, we're talking about creation. Verse 20, I want verse 20. For since the creation of the world, watch this. Since the creation of the world, watch this now. God's invisible attributes, we call that the essence of God. His eternal power, that's creator, and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood through which has been made so that they are without excuse about God. And yet I, I'm a, I'm a lake guy. I'm not so much a mountain guy, personally. Now, I like, I like to go visit the mountains, but I'm, I'm a lake guy. Mountains don't do anything for me. A good sunset on a mountain, though, a good sunset. Whew. But for me, give me one on, the, on, the, on lake or on an ocean. For me, I can go down there and I can sit at golf shores or someplace like that. And I just get beside myself with God, right? I, I really like water. I don't know. It must be a birth thing. I don't, I don't know. But I really like water. Mountains are all right. But I just get, I get calm. I, I just, I like water. It just does a lot. Now, I have never been in tornado hurricanes or anything on the, on the water, so I might have a whole different attitude if I was drowned in water. But, but I do like that. And, 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 and even as a little kid, I, could, I like to lay on a, in a Michigan, on a Michigan summer, I'd lay out on the lawn and look up at the heavens when it was just as bright, just bright. I mean, you could just like reach up and touch the moon. And I could just have all kinds of experiences uh, with the creation I was seeing. Uh, it, I, I didn't have a clue about God, but I did have a clue about creation. And later when I discovered God and he was the creator, then I began to get really, now when I walk down and I go through the, that or I, I see a full moon on a clear night and look at all everything going on, I just get goofy about the whole thing. I mean, I love to get up when I'm in Florida or Gulf Shores, I love to get up really early in the morning and take that walk on the beach. I mean, that, that's, I, mean, I can get more stuff in my soul going for God. It's just amazing to me. But, but, but that's just, I mean, my point is creation is a visual aid of who God is. And, and look how he's described here in, in verse uh, um, 20. This is a clear, you can, clear, the creation of the world can be clear, can clearly see through creation. The eyes, heart of man can clearly see his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. Right? In other words, God, I mean, creation tells you God's an awesome God. Okay? It, it brings you to God consciousness in a very strong way about God. It's not a, you're not, God consciousness is not about becoming conscious of a word, but of a, of a identity of a person. And that's what the writer is trying to tell us. Being understood through what has been clear. For even though they knew God, watch that, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculation. Now, see, they're dabbling with worldly view about this. And their foolish heart was darkened. It was, it was darkened by it. It went into a, into a deeper sense of darkness. Professing to be wise, they became 
fools, and then we get into exchanges. The rest of this passage deals with what you exchange just from a God consciousness level. <clears throat> and uh, so for the unbeliever, creation is a wonderful visual aid. And it depends on how far they get in their journey away from that concept, what kind of exchanges. The more exchanges they make from God to the world on what has been brought into revelation in their soul as an unbeliever, the, the farther they drift from God consciousness. And guess where they're going? They're going to the other system. They're going to the other system of the viewpoint of creation. And we're loaded up to our eyeballs in it because the church doesn't, doesn't speak a great deal about it themselves. But the church is confused between evolution and creation today. The church is. The church is confused. When a believer goes negative to the truth of the word of God, demonic wisdom fills the void with an alternative in the Christian way of life. For example, Peter, you remember this famous passage in 16, I refer to it all the time because it's so, it's so prevalent when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. I mean, he makes it very obvious. And, and I'm confident that must have sh shook Peter's world when he said that. I mean, that's strong terms when he says that. Um, And he, listen, he says, it's your viewpoint that stands in opposition to mine. I told you, I told you, I'm going to Jerusalem. I, I told you one, two, three, four, five, six. I told you right down the pike, and you refuse to believe me. Right? Not only have you refused to believe me, now you're trying to persuade me not to do it. That's a stumbling block to me, see. See, if you didn't, a lot of times you don't believe what he's saying, but you don't challenge it. Listen, listen they have a right to believe what they want to believe. They really believe that. But, you know, if they're interested, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll sure engage. But I, my job, you know, they believe that, they believe that. I mean, I meet pastors who go like, well, I, don't know. I go like, well, he believes it. Hey. I mean, he, he didn't come in here for me to be his teacher. He came in here to straighten me out. So I go like, okay, I'm straightened out. I'm not going to fuss with you. If you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. Let's bring your Bible in next time. And bring your Bible. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you. It's your position. Hold your position. Yeah. I'm just telling you how I do it. I'm not telling you how you should do it. I'm just telling you how I do it. I don't fuss with people who come to teach me. I can either take the position as a student or I can take the position of a teacher. If I take the position of a teacher, then I'm not going to fuss with you. That's your position as a teacher. Hold it. I mean, you're accountable to God. I'm not, I'm not accountable for it. I, I wouldn't do it, but I'm not going to fuss with you about it. That's your business. So Peter, you see, when Peter steps over the line here, see, I mean, you don't, you don't want to believe me? Don't believe me. But you stepped over a line. Right? Stepped over a line. Jesus re rebuked him. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 and 4, you see, we, 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 to the unbeliever, he talks this way with him, that Satan blinds the minds of the unbelieving ones. See, you've got to be that. You've got to reject the truth in order for him to feed you a line, a lie. Uh, I like 2 Timothy, the first chapter, 13 and 14. If you'd open that and put your eyes on it. Um, I, I really like this passage personally because of two imperatives. 
uh, I'm in 1, 13, 14, if I can find it. 1 Timothy 1. Uh, 2 Timothy, no wonder I can't find it. 2 Timothy 1. If I can find 10, there's 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 13, 14. See the word retain and guard? See the retain and guard? They're imperatives. And, you know, 2 Timothy is a pretty powerful little book. Many refer to it as the last will and testimony of Paul to Timothy. Paul says to Timothy, this is, you know, he's right in somewhere around 66, and Paul's going to die in 68. This is it. So he says, he says to Timothy, retain, that's a command, that's an imperative, retain the standard of sound doctrine, See, sound words is sound doctrine. Retain the standard. The standard of sound doctrine. You know what sound doctrine is? The doctrine that can be backed up. You know, a lot of times somebody comes to me and say, Ron, I'm really struggling with such and such and such. I say, okay, go back. You got a concordance. You got, let, let, go back and study everything. Bring me five arguments on your position, and then we'll talk. <clears throat> retain the standard. For me, retaining the standard of sound doctrine is categorical doctrine. Retain, it's an imperative. Retain, retain the standard. Retain it. This word is echo in the Greek it's echo. It means to keep, in the imperative, it means to hang on, hold tight, keep, have. Echo is the word have, but in the imperative, it means to hold on to it. Retain the standard. I mean, we, around here, we refer to it as, as a basic categorical Bible doctrine, in the elementaries of the Christian faith. Retain the standard of sound doctrine, which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard, imperative. Guard, guard through the, and, and this is one of those military words of guard. This is one of these military words, pluleso, uh, really important word. Guard through the Holy Spirit. Notice how you guard it. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which be, has been entrusted to you. The treasure. Okay. Hold on tight. Don't surrender any standard of sound doctrine. Never. Which you have heard. Guard through the Holy Spirit. It as a treasure of your life. Uh, pretty powerful stuff right there. The aim of demonic wisdom, back to my point three, the aim of demonic wisdom is to infiltrate the heart with false teachings of evil doctrines, like 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, should be 1 through 3. And then I gave you other passages out of 2 Timothy where this is Paul, Paul is really pushing uh, Timothy on retain and guard and all this kind of stuff. In the book of 2 Timothy, really strong book on the subject matter. In 2 Timothy 2.26, Paul says that they may come to their senses like the prodigal son and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Boy, that's a strong passage. I mean, that's his ultimate purpose, to get you out of the divine system of doing the will of God into his system to do his will. And so, he's, he, as my mother used to say, he's a piece of work, if you know what that means. He's a piece of work. Now, in conclusion, the key doctrinal issue of today's lesson is the source of one's wisdom. What is the source? Everybody has a source of your wisdom. And it's very important that you know it's either demonic or divine. And you need to be confident about that. I'll tell you one thing I know for sure. Both sides quote the Bible. 
Let me tell you, the one guy who carries his Bible around with him all the time is the devil. And you're not going to catch him without a Bible. I mean, he carried it all the time with him. He caught Eve outside the cool of day, just left Bible study, and got her. He carried his Bible. What would you learn at Bible study tonight? Oh, really? Well, let's talk about it. I have a different view. No kidding. <laughs> it sure did. Not only that, but you see it in the real conflict in the church in Acts 15. You have Paul and Barnabas, the grace guys, come in, and you got the, all the other side, the whole other side, which Jewish, is all full of legalism. You know what they think? You know what James thinks before he wrote his book? He thought that Jesus should be a follower of Moses rather than Moses being a follower of Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Abraham followed him. Moses followed him. <coughs> when you get, I want you to write this down because you should read this sometime. Somewhere I wrote this down. Where did I write this? I wrote this somewhere. Well, anyhow, it's in Acts 21. I don't know where I wrote it. But write down Acts 21. Remember, Paul goes to Jerusalem with the offering, with the offering. And somewhere in that Acts 21, they approach Paul when he gets there. And they let Paul speak and give a report of his ministry among the Gentiles. Now, this is really important when you get in chapter 21. And he tells them about how people are being saved and the Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ through the gospel, the grace gospel. And he's talking, they're talking grace, grace, grace. Here's what people miss in that Acts 21. And I, I wrote it down somewhere, but I don't know where it is. But you'll find it. When he gets through, they boast about their converts, how many Jews have been brought and then they say something really important. Who have been saved are not our zealous of the law. Now, that should have been a red flag to Paul. Because that's Acts 15 all over again. You, you, listen, you can't be, you, a Gentile can't be saved unless he's a Jew. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> he's got to be circumcised. Right? Acts 15. In order to be saved. That should have been a red flag to Paul. <clears throat> and then they come back and they say, oh, by the way, Paul, <clears throat> your message of grace without the law is causing a real division in the church. And we can fix that today by you climbing over and do a ritual of the law with us. And Paul doesn't fight the fight. What about, uh, uh, how did it come? 20. 20. Acts 21, 20. And start there and read a few more. You will find this really interesting. And, and uh, Pam, verse 20. Glance, glance are really quick. Is James mentioned? Is James' name in it? In verse 20. Somewhere close to that 20 is James speaks to him when he comes in. Is it in verse 20? No, back up. Look, look maybe oh, 18. Well, there, it, yeah, it is. It's, it's 18. In 18, James. What's James say? Uh, the next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Yeah, and then they start this. And so they get in a boasting contest. Now, Paul doesn't do it to boast. Paul's just telling the he's come back, give a mission report like our guys do. Just come back and give a mission report. But it's the way they tagged it. They, they boasted how 
the Jews had come and were now zealous of the law. And, and you're, you're, you're killing us, Paul, because you're saying that they don't need the law. They have to have the law for salvation. They have to have the law for spirituality. That's their point. And Paul says, listen, he should have drew a line in the sand when they said zealous of the law should have been a red flag. And he should have took his stand like he did in Acts 15. He should have pulled out Acts 15, 11 like he did, but he didn't. He's going to pay heavy, listen, he's going to pay heavy penalties for that based on his spiritual growth maturity and his leadership ability to the church of Jesus Christ. The church was then divided from 15 to 21 to was divided into grace versus law. It's pretty obvious in chapter 21. And the champion of grace was Paul. And God is going to stick his nose in it. He's going to rub it good. And I warn you, I warn you, do not surrender grace for any cause. Never. And so I put on my paper, pay attention to the six stages. Uh, st it should be stages, not stags. <laughs> should, be, <laughs> should be stages of God's grace. You want to pay attention to this because the Christian life is all about grace, grace, saving grace, logistic grace, spiritual growth grace, suffering grace, dying grace, surpassing grace. It's all about grace. It's never about law. We live under the new covenant, not the old covenant. The law is what leads you to Christ. It condemns you and shows you you have need of a Savior. The source of our wisdom is the source of our application and production in our life. Evil in the heart produces evil behavior, James 3.16, and the point of our message today. All right? Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll let the guys off, and we'll see if we have a few prayer requests and wrap this thing up. Dennis has got to get home, and I, I'm going to get him out of here as quick as I can. I appreciate him coming. Father, we're so thankful tonight for your love and mercy and grace. We're thankful, Father, for James' correction in chapter 21. I'm stung by him because he hasn't. He's still playing the game that he was playing in Acts 15. But James, as he writes his book, has made a lot of corrections in it, and you've held it, and I'm thankful for it as we look at tonight. May we look at the solutions to the problems and how important the divine wisdom system is for our life and how the enemy fights it. He fights it. And so I pray, Father, that we would be grace-oriented people, not just in our conversations, just not in our teaching, but in our everyday life, the living out of it. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.